The scripture reading this morning will be Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. As Christians, we are members of the family of God. And what a supreme blessing that is. Having experienced the new birth of baptism, as we find in John chapter 3, we have become God's children. Galatians 3 verses 26 and 27 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Since we are children, that means that God is our spiritual Father. As such, we have the privilege of calling upon Him in a very special way. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the inspired writer takes this relationship between us and the Father as the basis for an important command. Let's look at this chapter together. 1 Peter chapter 1. God through Peter gives this command as the foundation of our lives as Christians. In verses 14 through 16, he writes, As children of obedience, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in the time of your ignorance, but like as he who called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living, because it is written, ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Because God our Father is holy, we as children should be holy in all manner of living. Our goal as Christians is to live as people who are striving to be like our Father, to be holy. He repeats this again, again idea in verse 17. There he writes, and if ye call on him as Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to each man's work, pass the time of your sojourning in fear. We're to pass the time of our sojourning in fear. The word pass refers to our manner of living. The ESV says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. That is, we must live with reverence for God, the one we call Father. In this verse, Peter refers to our life as the time of our sojourning. We're only passing through this world. We're here for a very limited amount of time. We're only temporary residents. And because of this, we need to strive to be holy in our behavior while we are here, just for a short time. One motivation for living as we should is a view ahead toward the judgment. Peter points out that not only is God our not only is God our father but he's also our judge. When we pass from this physical existence we will give an account of our lives. God will judge us and his judgment will be impartial. The text says he judges without respect of persons. Peter also makes it clear this judgment will be according to each person's work. That is, what we've done while on earth. We cannot simply live however we want and expect God to be pleased with us and judge us righteous. Furthermore, Peter notes the judgment will be according to each man's work. That is, we will be judged on an individual basis. No one will give an account for you. You will give an account account for what you have done. I will answer for what I have done. And that knowledge should prompt us to ensure that our conduct throughout this period of this temporary life is characterized by holiness. That we're striving to be like our Father. 
And so Peter provides motivation to godly living by directing our minds forward to the judgment. As he continues in the passage, he provides another motivation to proper Christian living, and that also involves knowledge. However, in this case, he directs our minds backward. As we continue our look at the context, we need to be reminded of the fact that we have been redeemed. We've just sung about that. What a wonderful thought. That fact should not only be thrilling to us as Christians so that we can say how I love to proclaim it, but also it motivates us to live as God expects. If we truly appreciate what was done for us in redeeming us, we will be urged to live holy lives as children of God. Let's continue in this context Starting in verse 18, the text says, Knowing that ye were redeemed, not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was manifested at the end of the times for your sake who through him are believers in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. Notice verse 18 begins with the words, knowing you have been redeemed. That's a wonderful truth for us to keep in our minds as we live each day. This knowledge will help us as we travel through this journey of life. No, you have been redeemed. And in this regard, we want to notice four aspects of this that are found in verses 18 through 21. As we examine these, these should provide a powerful motivation to continue in living in a way that pleases God, in a way that is holy like He is holy. The first thing Peter exhorts us to do is know from what we have been redeemed. Using the definition of the word redeemed, we understand we've been liberated by the payment of a ransom. In fact, the ESV says we have been ransomed. We've been set free from a terrible condition that existed in the past. Notice again verse 18. Knowing ye were redeemed from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers. Peter makes it clear we have been liberated from the old way of life. That life is described in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, where the writer says that you no longer should live the rest of your time in flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past may suffice to have wrought the desire of the Gentiles and to have walked in lasciviousness, lusts, wine-bibbings, revelings, carousings, and abominable idolatries. And while this list may not describe our specific sins, the point is that we were all living a life of sin. We were living only for ourselves, living for the pleasure of the moment. We were living according to the lusts of men, not according to the will of God. But a change has taken place. We've been redeemed from this. We've been freed from this way of living. In chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Peter reminds his audience, you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession, that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. They were previously in darkness, were no people, had not received mercy. And that was true of us when we were still in the world. We were in an awful spiritual condition. But a change has taken place. Now the opposite of true. We've been called out of darkness. We have become the people of God. We have obtained mercy. The mercy we so desperately needed. Praise God for that. We no longer live that way any longer. Since the word redeemed implies freedom, we also need to remember that before our conversion, we were slaves. 
In Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, Paul talks about this. But thanks be to God that whereas ye were servants of sin, ye became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching whereunto ye were delivered. And being made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Our redemption involves the freedom from the slavery of sin. We no longer serve sin as the master following its directions. Instead, through our obedience to the gospel, we have yielded ourselves to a life of righteousness. In addition, by using the word vain in our text, Peter reminds us that our old way of life was empty. It was useless. It was a life completely full of futility that lacked purpose. All of those who live in the world are living a life of deception. They believe they're living the good life when in reality their fleeting lives are simply being squandered. It is from that useless life that we've been redeemed. As Christians, we are now people of purpose. We are living according to God's design for us. And so living as God intends. And so verse 18 reminds us we have been redeemed from our old sinful, worthless way of life. The second thing Peter exhorts us to do is to know with what we've been redeemed. Since redemption involves paying the price for ransom, we need to be reminded of the price that was paid. And in verse 18, Peter shows that price was not an ordinary payment. He says, knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold. A monetary payment, no matter how valuable that silver or gold, was not enough to secure our redemption spiritually. As precious as they are considered, as eagerly as men go after silver and gold, they simply don't have the necessary value. They are simply temporal things that will eventually decay. Peter calls them corruptible things. The ESV says perishable. In chapter 1, verse 7, he speaks of gold that perishes. The human soul, the spiritual part of man that shall never perish, has greater worth than all of the material wealth on this earth. And since it is incorruptible, it can't be redeemed with corruptible things which pass away. And so, we were redeemed, as verse 19 says, not with these, but with precious blood, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. This is the highest price ever paid. A ransom that is completely without equal. In identifying that with which we've been redeemed, Peter gives us several important descriptions. He says we were redeemed with blood. Blood by its very nature is valuable. It has intrinsic worth because it represents life within it. As Job 2 verse 4 says, all the man has will he give for his life. In the hospitals, those that are on their deathbeds, how much would they pay to retain life? All they have. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. The blood of Christ did what silver and gold could not do. It was the price necessary to purchase our souls from sin. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says in reference to Christ, in whom we have our redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Because the blood of Christ was given for us, we're not our own. At the end of 1 Corinthians 6, Paul makes this point and says, You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your body. Notice there's a duty connected with the fact that we have been bought. There's a responsibility we have because we're not our own. We have been purchased by blood. 
Secondly, we were redeemed with precious blood. And that's true in two senses, both in our English and in the original Greek. There are two ideas embedded in that word precious. Something that is precious is considered to be that way because it has great worth, great value. For example, 1 Corinthians 3.12 speaks of precious stones, also translated as costly stones. One version says expensive, something of great value. However, something that is precious may also be considered that because of its value personally. It is precious because it is especially dear, as Thayer gives the meaning. And so think about that blood that is precious. Yes, it's precious because it has inherent worth, but it's also precious to us individually. A particular item that has been passed down from generation to generation in a family. Perhaps it's a letter written by a great-great-grandfather. That's precious. Why? Because of the cost of the ink and the paper? No. It's precious because it's especially dear to that family. Christ's blood is precious in both ways. Of the highest value, but also held especially dear to us personally. Because of what it means to us. We should recognize the price that was paid to redeem us was the supreme price. But also we were redeemed with blood as of a lamb. The word lamb naturally brings to our mind the idea of a sacrifice. The Passover lamb that was offered under the Old Testament particularly. This, however, is a reference to the fact that our Passover hath been sacrificed, even Christ, as Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. You'll recall that Jesus, as John the Baptist describes Him in John 1, 29, is the Lamb of God that does what? That takes away the sin of the world. The removal of sin is only possible through this final sacrifice of Jesus. And so we find Jesus described in Revelation chapter 5 or 6 as the Apostle John sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Jesus became the final sacrifice by offering His own blood to atone for our sins. But not only that, we were redeemed with innocent blood. Our text says it wasn't the blood of anyone, it was the blood of one who was without Blemish without spot. He had no blemish in himself. He never sinned. And so personally in his actions, he was sinlessly perfect. In addition, he was without spot. There was no stain that came upon him from another. He was completely innocent and without sin. And therefore, his blood, when it was shed, was innocent blood. 1 John 3, 5 says, And you know that He was manifested to take away sin. And in Him is no sin. It was innocent blood. Jesus not died not because He had sinned, but because we sinned. He paid the price for the guilty even though He was innocent. With regret, but not full repentance on His part, the Bible records in Matthew 27, 3 and 4, Then Judas, who betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Judas knew Jesus was innocent. He recognized his own sin, but recognized that Jesus never sinned. And so we need to keep in mind it was precious and innocent blood that redeemed us. As we move forward in the text of verse 20 of 1 Peter 1, the third thing Peter exhorts us to do is know by whom we've been redeemed. Having spoken of the blood in a specific way, Peter now speaks of the one who shed that blood. Look with me at verse 20. Who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was manifested at the end of the times for your sake. That pronoun who refers back to Christ. Peter has identified the price of redemption as the blood in verse 19, 
and specifically identifies it being even the blood of Christ. The one who has redeemed us is Christ, the very Son of God. It is God's unique Son, the very Messiah for whom the Jews were looking. No animal sacrifice was sufficient to secure our freedom. No man could redeem us. No angel could have paid the price. Our redemption is only possible through the sacrifice of the one and only Son of Almighty God. Our Savior gave Himself as the greatest possible gift. Why? To redeem us. Peter then continues by speaking more of Christ. He says, Christ was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world. That is, it was known before God even began His creative work that Christ would provide this price. It was God's predetermined plan. An integral part of the eternal scheme of redemption was that Christ would go to the cross. Our salvation wasn't a last-minute effort on God's part. The cross wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't an emergency measure. Rather, it was always God's gracious purpose to provide this sacrifice so that we could enjoy freedom. And yet this wonderful plan about Christ was only manifested to us at the end of the times. It was always in God's mind, but it was made manifested. It was revealed in the last dispensation to the mind of man. This contrast is conveyed in the original by the change in verb tenses. When Peter says foreknown, he uses the perfect tense. This knowing beforehand was before times eternal and remains to the present time. The eternal plan of God involving Christ continues as the divine plan. However, when he writes of Christ being manifested, he switches to the aorist tense, which points to a definite act at a given time. Christ came at just the right time. Galatians 4.4 4. Knowledge of God's ever-existing love and mercy also provides motivation for us to live lives that are holy like our Father is holy. In addition, notice that Peter points out what was eternally planned and perfectly fulfilled was for our benefit. Christ was manifested for our sake. He did it for us. That which was hidden for so many generations of old is now a reality and should be reflected in the way that we live. We should be holy like God is holy. The fourth thing Peter exerts us to do is to know for what we have been redeemed. The plan of God and the sacrifice of Jesus should compel us toward a specific end. Notice verse 21. Who through Him are believers in God that raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. As Christians, we are believers in God. With understanding of the truth from the Scriptures, we understand that we are people who put our reliance upon God. We put our confidence in the plan that He originated, the sacrifice of Jesus that brought our redemption. And that trust is not misplaced. God has given proof of His willingness to accept the ransom offered by Jesus, and His ability to provide forgiveness. How? By raising Christ from the dead. Who through Him are believers in God that raised Him from the dead. There's the proof. That's the basis of our faith is a historical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In addition to raising Christ, God also gave Christ glory, you'll notice. Hebrews 2 verse 9 speaks of the suffering of death and immediately follows up that with crowned with glory and honor. Philippians 2 8 speaks of Jesus becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. What does the very next verse say? Wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. And just as God gave Jesus glory, 
we have the assurance that He will be able to give us glory when this life is over. Because of these things, Peter says, so that your faith and hope might be in God. Is that true of you? Is your faith in God? Is your hope in God? One of the reasons why we were redeemed so that those could be true of us. Our faith and our hope are in God. Since the Bible uses that term hope with a dual meaning of desire plus expectation, we understand that our hope is filled with confidence. Yes, this life is temporary. We're just passing through. We're sojourning. That's true. But there's a hope that we have of the future. It is for this hope that we've been redeemed. Jesus paid the price so that we could have a wonderful eternity as our home. And so we've been redeemed for a purpose. Just as we have full assurance that God's power raised Jesus, we have the full assurance of His promise of eternal life. And He will keep that promise. And that should motivate us to continued faithfulness in the Lord's kingdom, knowing that hope. And we don't want to lose that hope by how we live. The command that Peter gives in verse 17 is that we're to pass the time of our sojourning in fear. You know, some people live here as if they will live forever. All of their attention, all of their efforts are centered on the things of this life. They're ignoring the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And they're laying up for themselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break through and steal. Their lives are consumed with the pursuit of material wealth, the pleasures of this life, and the other things that have no lasting value. They are those perishable things that Peter talks about. They're living a spiritually fruitless life without any real purpose. That should not describe children of God. We must live so as to make the best use of our time while we're here. To fulfill the highest purpose that God has for us. That's why we've been redeemed. With that in mind, let me ask you this question. Will you live this week the same as you did last week? Take a moment to think about that as I repeat the question. Will you live this week the same way you did last week? Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Since Christ has redeemed us, we need to redeem the time. And that's the message of Ephesians 5. In verses 15 and 16, Paul writes, Look therefore carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We must use the time we have here in the best way possible. We're to buy up the opportunities with a careful view of how we live. We separate ourselves from those who are squandering fleeting years with their life of worthless pursuit. Why? Because with a forward look, we will stand before God in judgment. We will give an account of what we have done. And that should motivate us to live holy lives before God. Our lives should be conducted in a way that the judgment will be a desire for us and not a dread. Our duty is to lead spiritually productive lives before the Lord, serving Him as our Master rather than our sinful pleasures, knowing we will give an account to God. But also with a look backward, because we have been redeemed. There was such a high price paid for our redemption that we should feel the obligation to live in a way that honors that sacrifice that was made for us. When we consider that we've been redeemed, grateful hearts should prompt us with greater diligence to be holy as God is holy. Let's appreciate how Christ bought us, that He redeemed us. 
He freed us from the slavery of sin, granted us the wonderful blessings that we have in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. And because of that, we should resolve to live this week better than we did last week. We should have a greater focus on spiritual things, a focus that is reflected in the way that we live. All of us are just temporary residents on this planet. Our time here is so brief. But how we live during this time will determine where we'll spend eternity. We should live with a depth of gratitude that will prompt us to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. How thankful we should be as children of God that we've been redeemed. We've been purchased by the blood of God. And let's not forget the price that was paid for that. Let's not live the same way we did before our conversion or the same way we did last week. Not all people, however, can accurately be described in the words of Peter as those who can call God their Father. Some have never obeyed the Gospel. They've never been born into God's family. They've not yet been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. If that's your situation, we urge you to submit to God's gracious plan. From all eternity, He had in mind your redemption and your eternal salvation. With a heart of belief, turn away from a life of sin. Confess your faith in Jesus' Son, the risen Lord, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. That's why Jesus died on the cross. If you are God's child, but you've not been living a holy life, We urge you to repent and pray that the Father would grant you His forgiveness so that you can be a faithful child. How will you live this week? Will it be in view of the fact that you've been redeemed? If you have a spiritual need that we can assist you with, we'd be delighted to do that. Just make that known as together we stand and sing. Will you come?